uh, invitation and introduction. You, uh, let me see. All right, do you see my screen? Yeah, but not in present, the presenter mode. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, go, I'll go now. Okay. Yeah, perfect. All good? All right, so I'm doing this talk live, so in case I go over time, please stop me. Um, all right, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, image, image GANs meet 3D engines and how we can marry the two to get really good 3D representations. All right, so at NVIDIA, the vision for the future is in 3D. Um, so anything that is built will be visualized. Anything that moves will sometimes be autonomous and anything that is autonomous will be simulated. So there is a need for really large uh, scale simulation that is physically accurate and can model really complex virtual worlds. So to build on this vision, NVIDIA has been working on creating Omniverse uh, here in the middle. And I'm actually stealing a couple of the slides from Lev Leberudian, who is my manager and a VP of simulation of technology, who is ba basically uh, running the show for Omnivia. So he's, he has been developing this platform. And this is uh, a platform for collaboration and simulation, which basically connects different 3D modeling software. So you can use Blender, Maya, or whatever. They all connect to Omniverse, which, which basically visualizes the scenes that you're editing. Uh, it enables multiple people to edit the same scene using different softwares at the same time. And it also very easily connects or plugs in different uh, tech. So for example, a new graphics a rendering algorithm, new physics, uh, or even AI. Right, and that's enabled by just basically Python, Python scripts into Omniverse. Uh, so it's all on online, it's available. So you, you guys, if you want to try it, I really recommend it. A lot of nice visualizations you're going to see today is all done with Omniverse. And as you can imagine, this powerful simulation platform actually enables a lot of downstream applications, including robotics. Uh, so here I'm showing DriveSim, which is a driving simulator that was, uh, the latest update was revealed by GTC by Jensen a month ago. And we all know that for robotics, um, particularly for safety critical applications in robotics, such as driving, simulation is really key for, for testing uh, the, the algorithms before they're deployed in the real world. Right, and simulation gives you all the control you need over the environment. You can create scenarios, you can control how many vehicles, what kind of vehicles you're gonna put on the road, the weather, the signs, um, you know, even the, the, the maps themselves. And then now it's the nice thing about this, this Omniverse, so this is all rendered in Omniverse, is that for the ego algorithm, so the algorithm that's running on this car, the world in simulation is the same, is almost the same as in the real world, meaning everything is rendered at the speed that it would, the, the sensor data would be received in, in the real world. And there's incredible photorealism to it. Okay. And, you know, there's a lot of simulators out there, and NVIDIA really believes that we should be simulating pixels because for something like robotics, right, for end-to-end for -end testing or even end-to-end -end training, you need to actually model all perception data, including cameras. All right, so in my lab at NVIDIA, Toronto AI Lab, uh, we've been doing a, a several research direction to kind of power Omniverse and its applications. So you know, we're working on synthesizing cities, synthesizing objects into these cities, um, reconstructing assets from all sorts of various uh, uh, modalities, point clouds, images, multiple view images, AR applications of so basically estimating lighting for photographs such that you can insert objects inside uh, correctly, and then different 3D content creation tools that enable artists to maybe create uh, the, ne the next generations of, of models more easily, such as 3D stylization and then image and 3D editing. Of course, the, the static scene is not the only thing we want, right? So for robotic simulation, we also need to model behaviors. So for example, traffic models, how all the traffic behaves, um, animation models, so how we can actually synthesize and infer human motions from videos. Um, and if we are really going to 
uh, use these uh, simulators that model pixels or any perceptual data, we need some uh, domain adaptation techniques, right? There are still gaps, no matter how hard we try, there's still going to be gaps uh, with the real world uh, cameras. So we need some, some techniques to actually adapt our models to um, from simulation to the real world and even vice versa. And you know, we also have some moonshot projects of how, how can we actually learn or can we actually learn simulation directly from data? And all, all of these 3D utility functions that we have been developing for, for various research projects is everything is released inside Kaolin, which is this SDK for 3D deep learning. Cool. Uh, this is the amazing team. So 16 researchers right now and quite a few interns that I'm not gonna name. So all the work you're gonna see today is, is thanks to these brilliant guys. All right, so today I'm not gonna talk about um, perhaps simulation so much as opposed to uh, image GANs meeting 3D engines, which is a topic of a couple of CVPR papers that we have here uh, at, uh, next, we're going to be presenting next week, and I invite you to check them out. All right, so we know that world or geometry interact with light, which, produ which produces images, right? which are captured by camera. Right, but images can also be produced using graphics renderers. So you have some artists that create 3D content, so it has full control over the world, maybe even where to place the lighting um, using you know, a plethora of different 3D softwares. And then there is a rendering algorithm that produces the image. Okay, so in the 3D world, there is a, an easy API of how I can modify an image, right? I can mess with the parameters of rendering. I can also control how I'm gonna rotate this object, the colors, um, maybe I can even modify local uh, local geometry where I'm going to place the light. So I have a lot of power, a lot of exposed APIs that allow me to control which kind of image I'm going to produce. In the real world, API is a little bit limited in a sense that I can, I ha can have some control, but I'm going to capture by moving with my camera around, but it will not be so easy to capture a pink version of this particular car in this particular scene. I would need to go and actually paint it let alone if I wanted to change, let's say the front headlights or something like that, right? So, so one way you can do that is, is using image GANs, right? Which essentially consume a lot of photographs that people have taken all over the world and consume them into this one AI model, which allows you to sample, um, you know, from some, some normal distribution or whatever, and, and then produce uh, good looking images. And it, the, the, there is an API to these generative models, right? Because you can now you can now mess or uh, modify some of these latent codes that are input into this model, which, which which gives you some sort of a control over the image that it produces. And we're gonna later talk about how we can actually uh, exploit these these APIs. All right. So if I'm gonna compare right now you know, image GANs, which render images, and then, you know, 3D graphics engine to produce images. What are kind of the good points on either? So both are easy to render, right? The left side is basically a forward pass through on your own work, and the right is a forward pass through a rendering engine. Um, on the left side, image GANs are very easy to sample different contents, different cars in this case, or different objects, right? I'm just sampling a new, a new latent code. Um, on the right, it's easy to sample a different view of the same object, but it's very expensive to sample different objects, right? And I need to either buy them, which is expensive, or need to create them, which is time consuming, or, you know, I don't maybe even have those skills. On the other hand, image GANs give you very high level control. So, you know, whatever kind of this latent code enable, enables you to control, which, you know, is to some extent limited. I, I'm not able to easily modify, let's say the front wheel of the car, um, or, um, but maybe the color is, is, can be done. Um, on the other hand, on the rendering software or the, the 3D engines, you get all the control you want, right? The high level control, meaning I can select different objects if I buy them, but then low level control can go and edit each individual point on this geometry if I wanted to. Okay, and on the left side, you know, image GANs produce nice looking images, but only in environments that the GANs allows them to create on basically on the images that we have seen during training. 
So this, these models are not easily renderable or plugged into a game engine. So whatever the GAN has inside is not really a content we can actually use in 3D engines, right? But this is trivial to do with 3D content, you can easily plug into any simulator. And the left side, so image GANs are completely differentiable. Why is this good? If I have an input image, I can very easily re-simulate it by basically optimizing for the latent code that would produce that image using just gradient descent or something like that. On the right side, uh, rendering can be differentiable in some cases, but maybe not, not in the most general case where I can have multiple objects in the scene and so on. Okay, so we basically want to have the best of both worlds. We want to easy to render, easy to sample, but have 3D content that we can actually plug into game engines or simulators. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Okay, so there's tons of photographs on the web, right? So here is me just searching for car and you'll get beautiful photographs of, of cars. So there's tons of content online, much less so in 3D. And if I go to Flickr and I just search for some very common objects, it's all in the millions. You know, you have millions of photographs of cars, vans, buses, buildings, everything is in the millions. And this is much less true for 3D models. So obviously the desire is, can we take all this content and turn it into 3D? Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take one class. In, in this case, I'm just going to show most of the stuff on, on cars and consume them with a style again. So we're just going to train style again on, on a lot of these photographs, I don't know, 50,000 or even more. Okay, and we all know that, that these image guns, such as style again, produce super realistic images. So these are just showing a couple of samples from style again. Okay, so now our goal is we want to build some AI that can just take any of these photographs that we can have available on the web and produce something that can be used in 3D, so in 3D engines. Uh, that means maybe a mesh with 3D vertices and faces, but maybe even more than that. So maybe materials so that, you know, I know something is metallic, something is furry or something like that. And maybe I even want to know some semantics in 3D. So for example, what are the different parts? Imagine I want to animate the eye of this koala. I want to know that this is an actual eye. Just having geometry there doesn't help me much. And of course, maybe also a skeleton, so I can actually have this koala here walking around. OK, so how can we go about doing that? Right. So basically, what we want is to take an image create some sort of a neural net, train some neural net that's going to produce this kind of explicit representation in 3D, mesh, lighting, and texture, right? Normally, what you need to train this neural network is actually have supervision for all these three different components over here, right? But this is super hard to get, particularly if all we have available online is, is images. Maybe that's going to change now with Apple Capture and so on, but most content right now is still images. But it turns out that I can get away of not having the supervision by basically turning to graphics, right? Because I can now take all these predicted properties, I can throw them in a renderer, and if this render is differentiable, then it's going to allow us to actually train this propagate gradient sentiment. So this renderer is now producing an image, it's basically just rendering it. And now this allows me to actually just have loss on the output image. So I can have a loss, a two, a one, whatever I want on the rendered image and the input image. Okay. Now this has trivial solutions. I could just copy here a flat mesh, which is just that image plane and the same texture. So in practice to make this really work, you typically need multiple views of an object during training, right? And enforce consistency that multiple views should be producing the same properties here in the bottleneck. Okay. And now we're going to turn to image GANs and we're going to show that this is actually enabled um, by, by exploiting the, the latent space. In fact, if you take the latent space of, of style GAN and you start messing with it, you find that the first four layers of first four layers of this latent code belongs to or controls the viewpoint. And the rest is kind of controlling the, the content, what is going to be depicted. 
right? So here we're just gonna keep the content code frozen, meaning we're gonna depict hopefully the same card, the same object, but we are gonna vary the viewpoint code. Okay, so this is basically showing this. So here I'm just varying the viewpoint code and keeping that content code frozen. And if you look at these images, it's almost, you're almost convinced that this is the same car, right? It's not perfectly true, but it's quite true. Even the environment behind it looks kind of consistent, right? Which makes me believe that this Gans has actually learned something about geometry, something about semantics. And the opposite is also true. So we're gonna keep the, uh, the viewpoint code fixed. So in each column over here, it's gonna have the same viewpoint code, but the rows are gonna vary content code, which basically means that, you know, for the same viewpoint code, I'm able to render different cars in that viewpoint. And I'm just showing here key points just to show you just how, how accurate the pose actually is. Right. Obviously, they're not going to match perfectly because the shape of the car is different. But just to give you an idea that the pose is actually quite aligned uh, by just keeping this viewpoint code frozen. All right, so this is basically the data we need to train our, you know, I'm going to call this the inverse graphics network, right? Where basically instead of me going out taking pictures of the same car, um, I'm just gonna use the, ge the GAN generated views of the object during training, and I'm gonna have a loss for consistency. And this turns out to work really well, in fact. And it allows us to train these no this networks uh, directly for just, uh, from just real images. So here is the result. So on the left side is the input image. Then I'm predicting the mesh, uh, the, the texture, um, and the lighting, and here is a re-rendered prediction in the same view as the input view. And just to convince you that 3D is actually correct, this is the same prediction rendered in other viewpoints. It's not perfect, so you can see that some specularities are not taken into account. I think this is mainly because of the differentiable rendering we are using is just a rasterization based, so it's not modeling secondary light effects. Uh, so specularities are not gonna be taken into account, but overall these are pretty nice looking models. Right, and now we have a way to basically take an image and turn it into 3D. So we have kind of fulfilled our, uh, the properties that we wanted because now 3D sampling is as easy as sampling images, either using image scans or just taking photographs. So here is a little demo, which basically shows you that now we can take an image and actually insert it into a 3D engine because it is producing 3D information. And this is again Omniverse that you're seeing um, in a scene. They're not, you know, as these cars are not as good as an artist would create them, but they're pretty decent. All right, great. Um, but let's not stop here. Let's try to get more things from image GANs, right? Just because we see how powerful they are. In particular here, we have a style GAN and it's producing an image. And what we're thinking is that if style GAN is actually able to produce this kind of image, it has to have geometric, but also semantic knowledge of the object. Right, so it basically produces these features and then there is a, like one layer that essentially renders or takes all those features and renders them into the image. So those features in order to produce this pixel here so accurately shaded and so accurately geometrically aligned with the rest of the object has to have this semantic meaning. Okay, and we're gonna try to exploit that um, by basically teaching Stalgan what is it producing. Okay, so we're just gonna sample a bunch of images. Here, I'm gonna just sample this particular image. And we're gonna ask an annotator to essentially label it to that exact detail that Stalgan is able to render, to produce. So in this case, we wanna you know, label the front lights, uh, the wheel, but not just stop at the wheel, we wanna have the rim and all these little parts here that compose the wheel. Even the door, the, the Stalgan is even able to you know, paint door, uh, like the door handle, which is such a tiny part of the object. All right, so now we have this annotation and all we're gonna do is we're gonna add like a very shallow ML MLP on top of the style GANs features. 
And we're just gonna train it to produce the segmentation that the annotator has drawn for that particular image. Completely supervised training, cross entropy, and we're just keeping style again, feature map and uh, the weights frozen. And we're training this very tiny MLP on top of this feature map, okay? And really kind of the belief over here is that because Stalgen has learned these features that are able to paint so accurately, and because it's able to you know, kind of extrapolate all these views, so it has actually learned the geometric alignments of different objects across different views. And that makes us believe that maybe we need to label actually very few images because all that knowledge, all that smoothness and all those correspondences are here in the latent space. Okay, so we're gonna label super, super few images over here. And here is the kind of the overall idea of this data set GAN that's gonna be presented next week. Um, we're gonna have an annotator that is basically labeling a bunch of images that we're sampling here, okay? And the, really the reason why we're gonna label the images we sample is because we wanna label things that Stalgan is able to produce and nothing else, okay? And, um, and then once you label a couple of these images and train this labor branch, well, now I'm basically turning this Stalgan into a data set generator, right? Because it's not only able to produce an image, it's also able to produce a semantic segmentation. Okay, so now that means that I have an infinite data set generator. I don't need to label anymore. I can just synthesize a data set, meaning I can synthesize images and I can synthesize its corresponding segmentation. Okay, and once I have that data set, I can train any, any network that I would have trained normally on a real data set. Uh, in our case, we just trained DeepLab on like 10,000 sample images over here. And then we can you know, test that deep lab on whatever test images we want. All right, what I'm showing you here is the entire labeled data set, entirely manually labeled data set, all right? Um, I think all the current data sets that exist are 10,000, 20,000 labeled images or even a million images. This is it. Here are all the labels that we're going to use, 16 uh, examples for faces, 16 examples for cars, okay? and annotated to this detail. In fact, it took 30 minutes to label each individual object over here. So it's almost as much time as you know, labeling the entire cityscape scene. Um, and we, we actually hired Antonio's uh, Toralba's mother to, to do this labeling for us. She's a very famous annotator. Um, and in, in fact, for this project, it took more time to debug the labeling than debug the code for the project. Just because if you only have 16 labeled images, any tiny mistake in the labeling can quickly propagate um, you know, to, to the labeled data sets and to the downstream models. All right, so here I'm showing the synthesized data set where I'm training what the 16 examples or manually uh, labeled examples of cars. So on the left here is the sample image from Stalgen, and on the right is this uh, segmentation mass that it also produces. And of course, the next question you're gonna have is, well, can I actually just label one single example, not, not 16 of them? So, so here we're gonna show that. So this is the only labeled examples that we're gonna create. And the question is, well, how can I synthesize other examples? And this is the segmentation it produces. It's not perfect. It's not as good as the one in the sixth example, but it's pretty damn good. Particularly if you think about it, I have labeled this car that is in a completely different viewpoint than some of these other cars, which means that Stalgan has really found in the latent space all those correspondences and is able to propagate these labels through the, in, uh, through the latent space, which is pretty cool. This is the same example for, for faces. And of course, you know, we, we have a bunch of other categories in the paper. So I love this plot just because, you know, I, was, I, I myself was surprised how well this works. Uh, so on the x-axis is uh, the number of image annotations. So in a five would mean five annotated images, 30 would mean 30. And here is mean IOU uh, in terms of segmentation accuracy. Uh, here are some baselines and the blue curve is our, our curve. So you can see that even for just one labeled example, like we're getting a huge gap 
with respect to any anything that at least was available at the time. So we took the state of the art semi supervised learning approach here. Right, so it's almost matching the performance of a baseline that uses like 25 times more annotated data. But what I found particularly exciting is that with like 19 labeled, manually labeled examples, we are basically matching the performance of a fully supervised deep lab, so the same backbone as we're using here, that was trained on almost 100 times more training data from ADE, like a supervised data set. Right, so basically, this means that we now need 100 times less manual work to actually train really high performance models. And I find that quite exciting. Um, so here are some results. So, you know, grand truth in the second column and the prediction. See that this is working pretty nicely. And you can also apply this method just frame by frame, you know, on the real data here on some driving data set. Here are some. Jensen's uh, GTC video in his kitchen. All right, so what does this give us in terms of 3D, right? So we have 3D mesh already from before, texture already from before, but now we can also produce parts. And not only in 2D, we can use the same tricks as before to produce texture in 3D. We can also now produce part map in 3D. And that allows us to do some really cool stuff, right? Because now we have priors about what kind of materials each part has, right? So this is gonna be transparent, the body might be metallic and so on. It also allows us to, for example, know where the wheel is. And now we can just kind of swap and replace this predicted wheel, which is not as accurate with a rigged uh, wheel that you know we, we, can, we can have an artist create. So let me just quickly play this video here. Anya, if you can conclude in like two to four minutes, that would be great. I can conclude right now so that I don't need to go. Or maybe I'll take one more minute. OK, cool. So basically, now I can animate these models. I can drive them around, I can put physics on them, and I can maybe plug them into my simulator. Here is the project page, coding data. But I wanted to just show this, and it's really just 10 seconds. Um, because we now have these GANs that are able to both synthesize images and labels, now what this allows me to do is just edit the part map. So I can just go take an image and start editing the part map. So I can change the shape, for example, on this front light or the wheel and so on. And then proper by that, that edit into the latent space. And that allows me to actually modify the image as well. So I can super easily, without much hassle, do interactive image editing to a really high level of detail. I can change, I can make all these changes here to this image. And those edits actually also transfer to 3D. This is just like a very first early result. We still have work to do to improve it. Awesome. I think I have a little bit more material, but I'll, I'll stop here. Awesome. Yeah, a lot of uh, fascinating demos. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if from the audience and if there are any questions, we have two minutes. Feel free to just uh, unmute and, uh, and shout out. And maybe stop sharing. Any questions? Feel free to um, speak or like uh, type in the chat box. Uh, yes, hello. Um, fascinating talk, first off. Um, I had a quick question about um, just the high frequency details of images. I noticed that things like wrinkles and maybe the spokes on cars don't render properly or maybe aren't labeled as well as the rest of the car. So have you looked at um, you know, any ways to mitigate that um, at all? Yeah, right now we are basically at the mercy of whatever the generator is able to do. So it's true that the wrinkles on the face, sometimes there are wrinkles um, on cars, those details are lost. Uh, that's true. And, you know, maybe uh, the license plate would not have all these details. So right now there's nothing else to do rather than just improve 
start again. All right, and there's active active um, uh, area of research, right? So I think this is really a direction where the, these generators are going to become more powerful every day, and um, you know just create better and better presentation learners. Um, but yeah, right now it's it's you you can certain details that are not rendered, they're not going to be in that feature map. So we didn't even attempt to uh, label them. Maybe we should have, but we we haven't. Okay, thanks. But it's a good point. Okay, there's two questions in the chat box that I'm gonna just read out a lot. So uh, first, uh, Andrew is asking, um, can this apply to human hands? Like, how how can they handle occlusions in that case? Well, I mean, I don't have access to a human hand data set, but I would imagine if you have tons of just pictures of hands, you could train a really detailed um, style gun model. And then I would apply the same thing, right? I imagine that you could you could label really a lot of detail on the hand, you know, including wrinkles and knuckles and everything. But it's a, it's a great idea. I would love if someone tries it. And um, Marco have a uh, more like clarification questions. So like, do we need to annotate like the car image with the image mask for the foreground cars uh, to remove the background uh, for, for training? Yeah, I mean, here we only focus on cars so that like we automatically didn't label the background. Um, so we just basically annotated the foreground with like 16 foreground cars, that's right. Mm -hmm. And we were a little bit careful because Stalgan sometimes synthesizes images that are not looking like a car. So we basically, when we do the same thing, we create, we basically uh, choose good looking uh, images. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Is it yes, to uh, last, uh, yes, please. Um, did, yeah. you, uh, did you test the resolution of the 3D object in terms of, I don't know, graph representation or voxel uh, amount and its relation to the, uh, the original frame uh, resolution? Yeah, so the ac accuracy of the shape is hard to measure because we are, we're only using images. We should have probably run it on synthetic data, but then there's the main gap and so it's a little bit hard to evaluate. Um, so what we evaluated is back projection of the mask and then you label the, the actual parts and the entire mask and then you can measure the accuracy of that, you know, um, back projected mask and back projected parts. So that was the only kind of 3D evaluation that we did here. Um, in terms of pixels, we have, I think maybe we have, I, I don't remember actually, uh, but we should have. Okay, look like in the basically paper. Basically, we're projecting texture, right, and comparing. Yeah, sure. That's, I, I didn't mean accuracy, I meant resolution. I mean, the, the level, like, um, I know that um, maybe 256, uh, like, in degree of three is like a standard for people i don't know how for cars how much have yeah you, i think have here any... we use like 500 resolution so the car would be a bit smaller but there's a couple of limitations here even when we go to 3d we only have a mesh of uh, i forgot like we do course to find so i think it's like 600 vertices and then maybe like 2000 or something so that's already kind of limiting and it's always a sphere that deforms to the geometry so it's not going to be able to handle holes and and stuff like that and in terms of Thank generalization, you. I actually wanted to, like, I basically threw like a picture of Batman car and, you know, all these cool um, James Bond cars. And it doesn't work on things that are very out of distribution. So things that, you know, we have never seen in training and things that Stalga never generates. It was just not part of the, this multi view training data and it's not able to handle them at test time as well. But that's active area of research, I guess. I see. Thank you. All right, so maybe just like one last question uh, from uh, from Kate, uh, Katerina, and I saw you raised the hand. Do you want to ask? Yes, yes. Uh, so fascinating work. I have, I'm really, really love it. But just to make sure, so so here basically we pick a category, let's say panda. We collect tons of images, and then we apply the best, let's say, disentangling generative network like Stalgan, and then we inspect the latent space and. If it is entangled, we go ahead and label and, and it's good. And if it's not, then we say like two things. Either we need to throw more data or we wait till the generators become uh, stronger. So, so my question is, what can we do to help the gun disentangle? Uh, because true. right now we treat it as a black box, right? So you just put data and then you train and then we, we hope that somehow things will emerge. 
And if it doesn't it, emerge, it, then we can do nothing, let's say, to help it, right? It's true, but there is a lot of active research that try to actively disentangle the latent spaces. In fact, Stalgan has really been designed to have this kind of style layers, right? Right. So do you think that adding supervision on those style layers could help us? So instead of just throwing tons of unlabeled data in Stalgan and hope on its own to do everything that we, we should intervene or? Because, for example, the panda will not be as well uh, generated as the car. Potentially, right? Oh, it's only because I don't have 50,000 panda pictures. I truly yeah. believe that in order for these GANs to be able to render, and you probably all have seen these latent interpolations, right? You take two images, yes. two latent codes, and you interpolate, mm -hmm. and all the interpolations look good, which means that it has found these correspondences in the latent space. So mm -hmm. this semantics exists there. The full point is that it has to exist in order to be able to render that stuff and do all these nice little geometric and, and semantic transformations. Now, Got it. If we, train, if we train different weights for every category, right? so the panda and the car will be different, but the car and the truck may share the same generator, for example, and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So right now, our limitation here is we just downloaded the style game. So we have a style game per class. What we're doing right now is training one bigger model for multiple classes, multiple mm -hmm. classes that share some similarity. So like, let's say all vehicles, you know, mm -hmm. all kind of animals and so on. I think I think the generator are not really there yet. Uh, big GAN, style GAN, if you just want to train it on the ImageNet scale, if you look at those images, are not there yet in terms of quality. But these individual GANs, if you give it enough data, they're, they're pretty decent. The object-centric ones, got it. Because my hope is that if I'm able to train one generative model across, maybe like an entire image net, right? Then maybe these labels propagate from car to all the vehicles, right? Or right. from legs of a table to legs of a sofa and like other classes. That would be right. you know, amazing. And just one uh, related question. Does this image need to be object centric? So the car need to be in the middle and the panda in the middle, right? We don't just take random images and throw them to the, to the generative. Um, so this this style again at least needs to, to have objects roughly aligned. Otherwise, it's harder to learn. Now I, I haven't talked like I had five more minutes where we are doing this for the entire driving scenes. So we're basically training the style gans and the video model for like entire driving scenes. It's not you know the quality is not perfect yet, but there is there's really signs of this working for more complicated things. The 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 gun the drive gun paper or the something. drive gun paper. That's right. That's right. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we did the same trick as with data set GAN, but on drive GAN.